I'm Jeff Nally for the Legacy Series with Dr. Fred Whitford from Purdue University. Today we're talking about don't freeze up and we're looking at the spray equipment. We're thinking about a busy season that we've just completed, but the fall is a wonderful time, early winter if you will, to make sure that the machine is prepared for the season ahead and prepared for the spring season that's coming ahead. Uh, you betcha. So, I mean, you look at a picture like that, you know it's cold, uh, you know that water does freeze, it still freezes. Um, mm -hmm. And you know that what we're really thinking about is the springtime. It's during this time that at, the, at our ag retailers that we're selling seed, next year's uh, spray, next year's uh, uh, treatments, uh, fertilizer seed, uh, chemicals, all that sort of thing, right? So what we're doing here now is getting prepared to get it through the winter, but more importantly, to get us in the spring so that we can come out of the gates running. So don't freeze up. We're making a reference to obviously uh, parts on the spray apparatus that can freeze in the winter season. Uh, we also don't want to freeze up for the spring ahead when it's time to go. We don't need to be sitting still. That's correct. Now, you know, the easier, easier said than done, as we always say. And, you know, most of us in the, in the ag business, we revolve around our growers and our customers. And obviously to them, it's planning. Mm -hmm. That's when we're, we want to be bringing all kinds of stuff to them. Uh, harvesting and in between all the things that we have to do to get a grower our customers through the season now all that depends on getting this equipment done in the winter time late fall early winter to get it winterized and get it maintained so that when spring starts and we have to start making all of these deliveries um, then we're ready to go that means sprayers you name it trucks equipment uh, fixing uh, anhydrous tanks whatever the case is we're going to focus on the, uh, the sprayers and getting them ready. So we're ready to take a look at that and it's a neat opportunity uh, not only to prepare again the machine for the winter but also for the season ahead and there's some intricate details that need to be uh, need, they need attention. That's correct and this is going to be two ways that we look at this. We'll talk a little bit about dividing this in the fall and the winter with fall maintenance and actually getting the, the equipment ready for freezing temperatures. Mm -hmm. So let's focus first, Jeff, if we could, on the fall maintenance and some of the key concepts there that we would like our applicators to take a look at at their equipment. These things aren't cheap. You buy them new, they cost a lot of money. So there's one reason that you just want to make sure that you're uh, extending the life of the machine that you purchased or certainly even the resale value later on. Yes. And so some people say, well, I've got a pull behind spray. Well, yeah, that's still sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 depending on what you're putting on it. Uh, other people got a $500,000 machine. Other people can't afford a whole lot, so maybe they've just got a very cheap machine. But ultimately, we want these pieces of equipment to last as long as we can still operate efficiently. It may be a new machine, but it may also be under warranty. And even in that, there's the responsibility on the owner to keep up your part of the deal on uh, maintenance. That's correct, because um, why should a manufacturer pay for something that we didn't maintain? Uh, on the equipment manufacturer. So this this year we had two people who their warranties were uh, were basically null and void because they had not done their part to maintain that warranty. Nothing like being in the field when the machine is working exactly like it should and nothing like being in the field when a lot of things are going wrong. Another reason for maintenance is peak efficiency. Uh, to keep it running. We, we ag retail we make money by running not by sitting and being idle. So whenever we're not running at peak efficiency, we're losing, we're losing money. And that time that it is in that uh, peak season when we're working hard and there's an emergency repair, you've got lots of expenses that come with that, but probably none bigger than the downtime. Yeah, so uh, downtime is one plus $150 or whatever they're gonna, you know, you're working with from uh, opening the door to come to you to come back to that door, that could add up to significant money. And what we don't have in here is if something goes wrong and your chemical is leaked out into the environment, uh, you hit a waterway, uh, you have a, uh, a air hose, a hydraulic hose that breaks, people are injured. So again, uh, probably part of this, we should be talking a little bit about human safety and it's another reason why and environmental safety. Too. And one more point in the fact that just those little repairs can prevent really big repairs later on. That you betcha. And that's a fact, it always has been. And uh, the longer we delay fixing something, the worse it normally gets. So. Now, so what we want to do is instead of just going specifically uh, talking about specific things, we want to go out to the ASMARC uh, Ag Center 
Um, and what we're going to do is talk to Greg Yoder. And so uh, Greg's going to share with us a, an overview of everything that we're, that we're going to be talking about in just a, just a minute or so. Greg Yoder, good to see you again. Good to see you, Fred. Uh, so we're here at the Asmark Applicator uh, Center. Um, yes, so what we're going to talk about here today is winterizing the equipment. So, I mean, you're okay. a former manager. You managed yep. uh, uh, for how many years were you in the business? Well, 35. I ran a sprayer the first 15. And so then. you've seen it on both ends. Yes. From the applicator's end and being a manager. Correct. So, you know, it's the same old stuff, maintenance, 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 and, and then we counter argue time, time, time. It's the yes. same. On, well, no matter what we do. That has not changed over the years. That hasn't changed that either. Has not so changed. It is not going to change. But I'm sure as a, as a manager that you have uh, seen where people have not done, have not completely done a winterize, completely winterized the tank, and we had pumps to break, um, seals to break, on and on, right? I mean, Correct. so it happens. All right. So what we want to do before we jump right into the antifreeze and, and winterizing it, I, I always like to go back and say the goal here is is to kind of get the piece of equipment ready for the spring. Correct. And it's just not the water and the antifreeze. We want to look at these hoses. Yes. And so uh, the idea was any pressure hose can do two things can happen. They can get blown off and or they can rub and bust rub through. And burst. Yeah, and burst. So if you looked at these hoses that we have on this demonstration unit here, uh, do you see, as you look at the pressure hoses, do you see anything? Yes, yeah, so obviously right here you have one rubbing right there on the frame. Um, and as you're bouncing through the yeah. field, that constant motion of rub, 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 and it's going to rub a hole in it. Uh, even hoses that wouldn't move. This one, very stiff, but it's up against metal. This one here is up against a hose clamp. Yes. Now, all points you, where they could rub through. That's a visual inspection. That's all I'm saying is. And then I'd like to see you do then is to look. Now, if if you have these hoses like that's rubbing, we've got one here that when it came off the unit, somebody must have been, uh, uh, it must have been rubbing somewhere on the back side, uh, and they decided to add this sleeve on to it. Add that sleeve. And so what's the point of that? For your metal or your clamp or whatever to be rubbing on that, not on your hose. Yes. You don't want to find out in the field that it's rubbed through the hose and you're spraying liquid and all over. Actually, if, and when we get a close-up view here, we can see that this one here actually has the bolt that's actually rubbing on it. Correct. And what they've done is, is actually put that piece right there on it, right? To keep that, it from to rubbing. To keep it from rubbing. Now, maybe I could reroute it, but you made a good point a while ago that these hoses are routed for a reason. For a reason. When you come up from the factory. Yep. And, and this one might be, just point out, it might be just a shade long, and that's why it's up there rubbing on the bolt. Gotcha, so. gotcha. So I've done my hoses, everything's fine. Let's focus just a couple of minutes on clamps. Uh, we have two kind of clamps that's generally used, radiator clamps or worm gear. Correct. Um, then we have the T-bolt. The T-bolt clamps. So tell me about why as an industry, especially on pressure hoses, why we love the T-bolt clamps. They will pull more evenly in a circle and clasp the hose more to the barb than as a worm gear clamp. We have a flat spot in there and that circle square usually doesn't fit. Well, good point. Circle squares <laughs> don't fit. They usually At least don't go. They never had that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe in today's world they do, but they didn't. So that's the reason why specifically with these, tell, explain to me then why we, we are trying to rotate these around where the screw is on opposite okay, ends. And we've got them opposite and we've also got the points two different spots. So you're pulling a square there and a square there. So the point being it's gonna, the two of them together will clamp that That's right. more secure. So, so this is a square, but when I bring this one around, it's the circle. That's clamped there, right? That's correct. So it's making up for that kind of bad right. fit right there. But the tightest point of that clamp will be where that square That's part correct. is. Okay. So what basically Greg was telling us, it's, it's hoses and clamps and taking a look at some of these other things as we go into the winter to make sure that we don't have that breakdown in early spring. 
So Jeff, here's an example here uh, of one that was uh, that, that we took recently, and there's a couple things that are wrong here. Do you do you see anything here? Well, after having a chance to work with you through several of these uh, particular series on different things, I've learned that rubber hoses and steel don't go together. And here's a place where we've got uh, a major hose that is rubbing against steel. And we've also got a hose here that I'd have to question how long that's been in service, but I'd really have to question how much longer it's going to stay in service. Wow. So this is a used piece of equipment that uh, people I was working with at first has got a good deal and it's actually an upgrade over what they had. So they're happy, but when I looked at the hose, I said, this hose is already, it's just already dry rotted. It's already seen its day. In fact, the more we look, we begin to see where the hoses had been rubbing. This one, we flipped around to show you. You can see the rub marks on it. Um, and so this whole sprayer is gonna have to have the hoses replaced. It was a used one that they didn't look at the hoses because it is about to go. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of ways that if you're looking at a sprayer that as you inspect there may be these rub points and you can do something about that now. Sure. Now sometimes we can replumb, redirect the, the stuff, but usually when these hoses are put on the machines by the manufacturers, there's a reason that they're placed there or they would have they would have done something already. So here is an example. You can see that I've got an, uh, a sacrificial hose. You had another mm -hmm. name for it. It's just a shield that just wraps a shield. around the hose. Yeah, so all they're doing here is actually protecting this black hose from rubbing on different places on here so that what gets rubbed is something that doesn't make a difference. Not something that you can redirect, so something you can shield. That's correct. And that may save you that big uh, emergency repair in the middle of a yes. season and or having your State Department of Ag or EPA come out when you have an environmental spill. Exactly. Uh, then it's too late, obviously, uh, you, you'll deal with the consequences. Uh, this one here is kind of unique, and if you can see right here where they got the hoses going through it, and so I assume that the manufacturer, Jeff, put that, I'm, I'm gonna call it a grommet, I'm not sure that's sure what you call it, but you can see what, what they're doing, but you, you also found something else, did you not? Well, we're still looking at a situation where there's rubber hose on steel, and we might say, well, that's rubber on steel, but gosh, that's, that's smooth steel, so that's gonna be okay, right? Yes, um, it, it, the answer is no. I have seen hoses rub on hoses and actually eat into one of the hoses. Mm -hmm. So anywhere that I can't see light, it's, it's probably a good place just to pull it up and look at it and see what the consequences of that rubbing is. You might want to look at some sort of shield or divider yes. in the two. It's a little fixed now, but it saves a big problem later on. And people that have really paid attention to this, you, when you look up and down their machines, you can see where they've taken small pieces of leather or taken an old hose and cut it up in the sections, fit it right up under it, tie it off, and we're done. And once they're done, they're done. And that's the beauty of it. It's not something that's going to be happening a lot. Now, so Jeff, the hoses is one of the places that uh, that we have lots of breakdown, mm -hmm. where the where the hose actually uh, forms that bubble, mm -hmm. balloons out, and burst. Mm -hmm. The second is when under pressure these hoses get blown off. Mm -hmm. uh, you, ever, you ever use on your farm one of these clamps? Absolutely, and we talked about uh, we saw from the video there were different times of clamps. This is a this is an old worm gear clamp, and with me and a screwdriver, absent a nut driver, you can pretty well count that knuckles are going to get skinned somewhere along the way. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to tighten it as tight as I can, and I'm probably going to strip out some of the places here. So it's a good clamp, but it's not the perfect clamp. That's here. right. It's a good clamp. And, and again, I, I opened this up so people could see how this actually operates, and you can see the little grooves of the screw just fit in these clamps. It is not, there's not much uh, uh, distance in that hole, so you could see when you over tighten it or untighten, over tighten it, this thing here is not meant to last a long time. Mm -hmm. Easy to screw up, easy to rust if you've got fertilizer products and on and on. So what we learned from the video before is while uh, one clamp's good, maybe two's better, the problem here, the tightest part of the clamp is here at the top, and those clamps are symmetrical. So there actually could be a place here where that hose is leaking. While this looks good that they're all designed the same, they really need to be rotated. So if, what I think you're saying was, uh, what was it about a, a, a circle, a peg? That's right, you can't take a square peg and put it on a round <laughs> hole. And here, uh, the, the bolt isn't round, the bolt is straight. So this is a point that this is ultimately square and the hose is round. Yes. So you're not going to clamp that hose with one and if you put them both in the same place, you're still not, yes. you're gonna to need to rotate the position. Well, this is what we're looking at here. So uh, we know that this one here is that straight piece on the right. round. So by, by doing alternate like that, I this one is making up for that one where it's not quite as tight, 
this one is making up for this one where it's not quite as strong. There was an eye appeal to the others, but from efficiency standpoint, it needs to be done this way. Actually, I never thought about that. So sometimes it does look better for them to be straight up. And, I mean, look just the same. Uh, eye appeal probably goes a long way. So there is a science on why we have to have two, it, we can do two, as long as you have the bar that's long enough to be able to hold it. But there is a better option. Oh, there's a much better option. And that's called a T-bolt clamp. As you can see here, a T-bolt clamp, you can see that I'm not pulling against some little piece of metal. Um, this is a strong clamp, and let me get you a... And the clamping device, if we'll note, is rounded. And we're not using a screw, we're using a bolt. So I'm going to be able to hold tighter, and I've got a double clamp. Plus you'll feel better. <laughs> I'm not going to skin my knuckles with <laughs> a wrench. Right. We're going to hope anyway. And so here is what they look like in practice. And, and I wish that everybody, Jeff, that, that has on some of these high-pressure systems, because there's two places coming through the hose or the hose gets blown off, any place that where I have an option to use that, that to me is cheap insurance. It's about six bucks. May cost a little more, but in the long run, a lot more uh, efficient. And you can ask any person that works in ag, this is the one to go to. They'll mm -hmm. all swear by it, uh, no doubt about it. And the last little piece that we'll cover on this sort of get, getting ready for the spring fall maintenance is the batteries. And um, Jeff, these batteries are pretty expensive. They are. And uh, batteries uh, need to be handled correctly. And uh, if they're not going to be kept inside where it's warm, then you stand a risk of losing the value of that battery and the efficiency of that battery. Uh, they need to be charged or they need to be brought inside. Yeah. So I learned from one of the battery guys that would tell me that they do freeze, mm -hmm. uh, but it, uh, they freeze at 32. Obviously, bring it inside, you're pretty good. But they tell me if it's not fully charged, if, if it's fully charged, let me mm -hmm. back up a little bit, if it's fully charged, it takes about a minus 70 to freeze it. Mm -hmm. So I know that you were talking about your boat. Well, that's one of the common things that, you know, bass fishermen and others, especially where you're using, you know, like multiple batteries for the trolling motor yep. and for the rest, there's chargers that actually are a part, of the, uh, a part of the boat that you plug in, and those batteries stay charged year-round. Extends the life, yes. and certainly you don't have to wait for the thing to charge up. Nothing like going out in the spring and to hit the key and, and nothing. nothing happened. And nothing. You betcha. So... Last little piece on this is uh, one of our favorite pests that we have at, in the winter time in these barns are rats and mice. Mm -hmm. And they get awful hungry. I guess they're eating or they need to f make a nest by stripping off the wires, whatever the reason is that they do. Have you ever had anything chew through your wires at home? Oh my goodness. It's, it's one of those situations that you dread when you hit the switch and it's not there, it's not functioning. You've got to chase the wire and find it. So it's hard to think that a rat trap or or rodent management is ultimately factors into the efficiency of your spray rig, but it does. At every one of these field days we've been doing, it's just amazing people tell me their stories about rats and mice eating through the wires. Now what I'm demonstrating here is a product by Bell Laboratories. There's other uh, people that make rodent products, but they're one of the major ones. Uh, you can buy the traps like this from your local pest control company. Uh, but what's kind of neat here is I've got the four, the, the four pieces of metal. I can put two of these baits on each one. Mm -hmm. So I can set this outside in my barns and then have enough to last a long time because these rodents will eat it and you'll kill a bunch, but then there's more of them that seem to move in from wherever. Mm -hmm. because they like our they like our equipment they like our barns it helps to keep them as warm as possible so or you can buy the service mm -hmm. so the idea with fall maintenance is we do the things like we talked about hoses and clamps but we also want to look at the warranty when do we replace the oil what kind of filters what kind of air filters what kind of lube what kind of grease what all those things that go into a fall maintenance that's just you know making those sort of repairs and fixing. Now we get to the bad boy here, mm -hmm. it's the winterization. It's amazing the damage that can occur with water that freezes where it shouldn't, especially in a spray rig. You betcha. Now, there's three different ways of looking, uh, three different steps to winterizing a sprayer. One, first of all, we gotta get to all the chemical residue that we had during the year for many different reasons. That's another topic, Jeff. And what we'd like to do is to focus on getting it cleaned, but now let's get the water out of the sprayer and then add the appropriate antifreeze to it. Mm -hmm. That's the two things that I'd like to, to, to focus on. 
And I never knew the power of water. I know we've talked about it. Water expands and it breaks things. But I just thought that removing water from the sprayer was highlighted by this particular uh, demonstration. Uh, so let's watch him when he puts that pipe in into water and freezes. What happens to that pipe? No, no, no a that, tough. That's galvanized, galvanized steel, steel How pipe. Do you think that is? That's probably a quarter of an inch. Absolutely. So yeah. there's no way that. Well, that's not exactly true. So in the lab, uh, look at what we did just a little earlier today. Watch this. Okay. So the experiment starts with a piece of cast iron pipe, uh, a small little elbow. It goes down like this. You can notice we're trying to get all the bubbles out, so no bubbles at all. We twist this fitting in place and secure it. And this is our pipe that we're going to submerge to the cold temperature. All right, so the pipe filled with water is submerged in liquid nitrogen, which is 320 degrees below zero. This is just going to speed up the freezing process. Now, most liquids will shrink, actually get smaller when cooled. Water is a little bit different because water does shrink when it first gets cold, but then it actually expands until a temperature is reached of about four degrees Celsius. And then when it finally freezes, it has an explosive expansion to almost 9%, and you get something that looks like this. Oh, Is that amazing? Gosh. Did you see that flash of light? Like a gun, it was like a gunshot. Yeah, well, that flash of light wasn't lightning. It took out one of the lights in the oh. studio. Oh, <laughs> so no. we were all way, way, way back oh, no. and let that thing go for a second. Just this pieces. is the result. Now, the viewers at home need to understand this was just water that was inside. So this is what happens when it freezes. And, you, and, and water is this amazing substance. Everything else shrinks when it gets cold. So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, is it not, to what we just saw? where it just explodes. Mm -hmm. And if you think about some of the delicate things that we have on these lines, then you could understand why that's a piece of pipe. But we've got other things like plastic mm -hmm. uh, and other things that it can explode and break much easier than that. It just tells me that on a spray rig with as many elbows and tees and go. other connections, there's going to be places that if you're winterizing that sprayer, you've got to make sure not some of the water is out, but all of the water is out and that antifreeze gets in all the places that certainly could, uh, we don't want to witness uh, that and we certainly do want to feel the effects of it in the spring when it's time to go when something has sure. been damaged just out of neglect. You betcha. So let's go back to Greg and what we want to do is look at the whole picture again and let's get the ideas planted in people's minds that uh, what it takes to properly get a uh, uh, sprayer ready for winter in terms of the, the antifreeze. All right, so we've looked at our clamps, we've looked at our hoses. Now, we're all, we all know water freezes and water expands. It's kind of a unique, uh, it's it a unique chemistry, is it not? And this expanding can break plastic, can break seals, can break metal. It's pretty amazing what it's the pressure. very, very strong. You betcha. So what we want to do then is, the object is to get rid of as much water as possible. Correct. So Correct. what we'll do is probably maybe at the end of the season when I do my tank clean out, we'll just use that as an example. I'm running my last load of water to you know my third rinse. I'm going to run it till the pump is just about dry or maybe right at dry. And that's going to do what? When I do that, what does that what water am I getting rid of? Basically all your the water you're getting rid of is the tank, the pump, and that's it. That's it. That's pretty much it. But I still got miles, what seems to be miles of hoses. Lots right? of feet of hoses yes. and And yes. places that I can hide. So anywhere, what's the idea with opening up underneath the tank, opening up here, opening up any valve? Basically called a drain plug, and that's exactly what it's for, to drain out that excess water for the end of the season. So it could be, it could be um, uh, any sort of banjo type valve. Opening it, valves, there's not this one, okay, see here we have a, that's our sparge line, but even to leave that valve in the open position, because okay. it's an electronic valve, leave it in the open position. A banjo valve, have it in the open position. Uh, maybe, and there's some, some debate on that, maybe even getting the pump and undoing the bottom of the pump to start with to drain that water out. I would definitely take the bottom drain out of the pump and, and drain all the water okay. out of it. That's, now, that's very important and we'll explain why later. When and you're in this way you're getting rid of as much as you can. The other one that I, I really like is the way that we have this set up here and you can see the angle. 
if we could have Correct. the angle of the booms up where the water drains, um, and you had a good point, what can I do at the bottom to drain that water out? Take those end caps out, let that drain out. Okay, and we got pretty much got it all. You're getting close to being the best uh, you can get. You're hesitating because <laughs> you know I can't get it all out. Correct. There may be places that are hidden. So now, what we would like to now do is, is, is actually put in antifreeze. Yes. Okay. So what we saw here, there's many different places that water can, is left, mm -hmm. how we can drain it, and we're talking about putting in antifreeze. So now let's take that information and look at specific things. Step number two was to remove the water from the sprayer. So Jeff, if, if I pump, push all the water out of the tank until the pump loses its prime, have I removed all the water? Absolutely not. So there could be some in the boom, mm -hmm. there could be some we'll see in the valves, there could be some in the pump. And after that demonstration of that pipe breaking, you think of that pump, if it has enough water to expand, breaking a pump down just as easy. And then uh, looking at water still left in the booms that we haven't touched. So when we run the pump, what we're doing is mechanically forcing it out. These are the kind of things here, the, these last ones, that we're going to manually drain as much of the water as possible. So here you're, you're looking at basically um, pushing all the water until the pump can't spray anymore, and you watch it turns off, it's done. And some might say at that point that it's empty and I'm ready for winter. Uh, and the reality is you're not. There could still be several gallons uh, of water in that boom, in the pump, and in the hose that's coming from oh, the tank. 20 to 40 gallons mixed up all through in the boom all the way back because the pump only stopped. Oh, it's still full. So now we're going to have to drain it manually. Mm -hmm. So here, this is uh, John at one of the Purdue farms. So let's kind of go back on this particular machine and, and see what it is that we can do to get rid of as much water as possible. Get this moist. And we are guessing, John, that we have in our system that we, 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 we have been working with, how much water would you guess is still in the system? I mean, we may have 20 gallons, you know, that's still kind of caught up in the booms or in the lower parts of the hoses or the elbows or, or any of those kind of nooks and crannies. Yeah. And so the object now is we want to try to go ahead and winterize this thing and get rid of as much water as we can and then run the antifreeze through to make sure that if there is any water, it's going to contact the, the antifreeze? That's correct. I mean, the, the, and the antifreeze is also going to push out what, whatever little bit of water that's left in it. And, you know, as we were going to see, gravity is your friend. That's where you want to get that, that water, just, you know, letting it drain out of all those places. All right. In fact, I want to make that point. That's what we've learned here, that gravity is your friend, and we ought to take advantage of it. And so um, how are we going to... How do we get the water out of this system here, what you have? Where well, are the places? what we're going to want to do is, is we're going to want to tip the booms up and loosen some of the pressure caps on the uh, nozzle bodies. And that's going to let a lot of that water, if the booms are up in the air, to flow down toward a central point where you can catch it in a bucket. So we would be what? Pulling water the way that we're going to angle these up. We're going to pull water in the booms and any of the hoses up in this area. Is that what we're going to do? That's correct. Yep. All right, and then is that going to get most of it? That's going to get most of it. We're still going to want to crack the valve on our fill hose uh, that drops down and, and see whatever we can kind of drain out of there too. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and try it then. Good okay. deal. All right. So you saw here we had we got water in the tank. We're going to have water in the fill line. We're, we got, there's water all over, and it's just a matter of opening up those valves and draining that water out. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all we can do. Um, and then trying to angle up, letting gravity be our friend, as John said, to try to force all of this water out into the points down here and push it out. It tells me whoever's going to do maintenance or whoever is preparing for winterization, you need to have a familiarity with the machine and those ideas of where water could be hiding, yes. could be laying to make sure that you get it cleared. And sometimes it's the applicator that knows where this stuff's at. The, the men and women who use this day in and day out, they, they know where some of this is. And so we're just going to see if they can participate and be able to know how to get everything out as much as, as possible. Now, so here we wanted to show by cracking valves how much water is still left. I mean, we've drained it. We've, did our, we've, did our, we've done everything that we can 
But let's open up this valve and see ready? what happens. Uh, that's the uh, the main fill line, and then we also have the rinse tank over here on the other side. Your five gallon bucket wouldn't hold it. That's correct. Because we had all the water still left in it. That's my whole point. Wherever we forget there's water, that's a lot of water still left in the system. Mm -hmm. So if you assume that just by running the pump would clear the lines, not the case. If you assume that raising the edges of the boom to flow the water out would clear the lines. That's correct. Still not enough because after you had done those, you would have exceeded that five gallon bucket that's even on that second that's correct. So. It's opening up everything that you can to get it out because, Jeff, if we don't get all the water out and we add our antifreeze, what are we doing to the antifreeze? We're diluting the antifreeze. We're diluting it and we don't want it diluted. So the object is do it here so we can keep the, the uh, antifreeze uh, at a concentrated form. And again, simple as pulling the plug on a, on a pump, draining it out. Uh, you saw in that demonstration what happened. Uh, let's make sure that the pump doesn't crack. And so we removed as much water from the sprayer as we could. Does that mean that we've got most of the water out, Jeff? We would say you've got a lot of the water out, but do I have all of the water out? And the answer is no. no. But you've got to start thinking about this from the bottom up. Yes. So if, if, if we didn't work, and they, it could be hoses mm -hmm. that, that, that got that sag in it. Most of them got sags. Uh, there could be places hidden in here that we just were not able to get it out. So now what we want to do is add antifreeze to it to do two things. Push out the water, just like it's just that's the fluid that's going to push it out. And then what, anti what water is, remains behind is actually mixed with the antifreeze, which is going to give us our protection. But not all antifreeze is created equal, as we're about to learn. Uh, that's, a, that's right. Now, we do not put car antifreeze, truck antifreeze, in a sprayer. Mm -hmm. A, it's expensive. B, it's not designed to be in our sprayers. That's to last a number of years, you, you think, the coolants uh, in your vehicles. Uh, plus, you understand that this is also dangerous uh, to the environment. Uh, it's also dangerous to wildlife, and, it just, and the list goes on. All that is written on, the, on that uh, uh, antifreeze. Uh, in fact, when you take your vehicle in, or if you do your own antifreeze, they all actually save it and are going to get it uh, disposed of properly with firms that pick this up. Now, Jeff, I think you were talking about you when you want to rise your sprayer, uh, you use RV antifreeze. Exactly. And you can see here it says RV antifreeze. And the idea here is this is for a short time. This is just to get us through the winter, which is different than the car. This we don't dilute. Uh, and does it work for you? Absolutely. Sure. And, and in the situation we find, uh, this is used in an RV where I may even have drinking water. So if it's okay to drink, then chances are it's going to be okay for the rest of the environment and it's going to protect my sprayer. Yeah, and if you read the labels, it's very clear that, that this is a relatively safe product compared to that. Now these two I didn't think so much about, but there are folks that are being pretty creative and innovative here. Uh, yeah, so what they're deciding to do is to do, uh, use de-icers that we put for windshield wiper fluids and they're using that, and the reason they're using it is it's cheaper than this, it's cheaper than that, and so they're looking at, all they want to do is to antifreeze, protect their, their sprayers. So, but by using those, am I getting some, some product that I really don't want in the spray rig? All right, so great question, and so what anecdotally, the few that have started, and again, it's, it's only two or three out of 50 people, but you see that movement there. Uh, a for cost. Second is we've had some complaints that they don't like. Obviously, if it's on the windshield, you got bugs. You're going to have to have a soap or something to be able to wash it off. So this has got soaps and other things in it that a couple of the folks have said they just don't like having that gums up in their mind. The anecdotal. I don't know if that's true or not. It's immaterial. I shared that with the group here not too long ago, and they said, "Well, Fred, you realize you could buy this product here." and not have it, you just buy the, the de-icer, not the soap. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And they said that now it's even cheaper than what this product is. So it might be something to do some investigating uh, for, sure. for what you want to do. But there's yes. one more step and that's the label. And reading the label is critical. If you could see very closely here, this antifreeze is good to 84 below. This antifreeze for the RV is good to 50 below, but they're not all the same, especially if we take a look at the next slide. Yep, and so you go ahead, since you were talking Here's about Here's the windshield wash and, and, and de-icer, 20 below. Hmm. Here's 35 below. Well, there's a lot of difference between a winter in Mississippi and a winter in Minnesota. Yeah, I picked up one the other day, it was plus 32. I, I don't think that's a winter product. That's a product that we're using right now in the summertime, you don't need that protection. Uh, but if you're going up to North Dakota, Indiana, Minnesota, you know, uh, you'll say, Fred, we don't get down that cold. Well, you, when you think of wind chills and how your equipment's stored outside, I wouldn't want to take any chances. So the bigger the number I can get here, the best it's going to be for me. It only has to be cold one time below the mark that's on the label to cause that hazard that you're trying to prevent. That's correct. So I, I look, again, just dropping for, and it's any of them, RV antifreeze, it's this de-icer, any of these, I wanna to try to get a number that's realistic for my, my area. And your point is, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas is gonna require different uh, numbers than if I'm at North Dakota, Canada, or wherever. All right, so we got the right antifreeze, and so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna explain about pouring it into the clean water tank that fills up the tank, the defoam, or uh, the foam machine. The tank also, it supplies the rinse water to the large tank, and then it also supplies water to the foamer. So by putting antifreeze in both, we're gonna winterize the rinse tank, the foamer, and have antifreeze to put into the big tank bed. So basically what John's saying is, by putting it in this one, it runs into the big tank, which is going to then, when I pull into the pump, out to the nozzle. And by doing that, we're also, when I put on my foam, the foam machine, if you still have one, it's going to pull water into that. So I'm, I'm actually running in the areas that I need protected. This is coming back to knowing your machine and knowing where to pour the antifreeze to make sure that it reaches all of those areas. The only one that you would not put antifreeze is the, is the water tank that you have on the side for your hands, for your face, whatever, because there all you're going to do is turn the spigot on and let the water just drain. It, you, you'll drain it all out the way that they're, that they're set up. So now, this is important for lots of reasons, Jeff, and, um, uh, and it's again another point to repeat. When we use the antifreeze, when it first goes in, I am pushing out the water that's there, right? Exactly right. So I'm also diluting the antifreeze uh, that I'm pouring in. So if this, and this is the color of the antifreeze, it, sometimes it's pink, green, blue, whatever. What would it look like when it first comes out of the nozzles? It wouldn't be that solid true color. Yeah, it'd be a lighter blue, washed out blue. The pink would be a real light pink. What you wanna do is to have enough antifreeze in here to keep the pump running so that when it comes out, it looks as blue as this, which tells you now you're running pure antifreeze out of the nozzle and you've gotten all the water that you could out of it. And you might not be able to visually see that transition, so a bucket under a spray nozzle to make sure that it's there is exactly right. So let's say you're using RV antifreeze and you didn't go through those exhaustive means to make sure you diluted the boom and yeah. you, you emptied the boom. If you put 20 gallons of antifreeze in the sprayer and you had 20 gallons of water left in the system, that's not good for 50 below. That's not good, that's right. And so those, those numbers, the more I dilute it, the less protection I'm gonna get or the warmer, the not the warmer, the temperature. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's not gonna go down what we think it's gonna do. You're, you're lessening your protection. You're lessening issue. your protection. So, so just, all of this, all of this is about intricate and detailed effort to make sure the job is done right. The first time, because you won't get a second time. That's exactly A crack right. pump is a crack pump. You're fixing to spend some money on, on a new one. So let's go, let's go back and, and listen to a person that's been a manager, who's been an applicator, talk about this winterization, whether it's uh, maintenance and whether it's the antifreeze part. Any, anything in, in conclusion here, this takes time, like everything else we got, time, 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 but what's your sort of your end piece? Why as a manager do you want this done? Extend the life of my equipment. I mean, breakdowns are expensive. 
and especially on this new equipment, the electronic valves and all that, they need to be preserved and you need to do the best to your ability. So when spring starts up, I can basically flush out the antifreeze and start running and start hitting the field. The last thing I want to hear is a manager saying, well, I missed this and I got some problems. I don't want to hear that. I don't. You betcha. All right. Well, thanks for all the information. Good to see you again. Look okay. forward to working with you. All right. Thank you, Fred. You're quite welcome. So I think about the high school coach that I had that said that failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Yep. And that's almost, in summary, what we've been talking about yep. here. So if you think about what we do in the winter time, once this, the season comes to an end, in the winter time, we're already planning, already planning with our growers what it is that they're going to need, to which varieties, how, how fertilizer sales. I mean, we're, we're already doing that for spring and the winter. All we're, I think, asking is, is to back up a little bit and say that this equipment is what's going to deliver all of these things that we're promising to our growers. And I think Greg said a, a, made a good point is, you know, the last thing he wants is a breakdown when it's time to now make some money and provide the services that we're being paid for. So the Legacy Series is meant to keep you safe and also to build that legacy, if you will, of success, of serving your customer, protecting the environment. It's just some good old common sense that needs to be applied on a day-to-day -day basis that can certainly save you a lot in the long run. For the Legacy Series and Dr. Fred Whitford, I'm Jeff Dowling.